Story Hinge, Episode 90, Lee Jessup. I feel like all of us have our morals and our ethics and the things that we believe in and the things that we are conflicted by. Um, and cinematic storytelling, visual storytelling really allows you to explore it in such a meaningful way. And I just, I just wanted to play. Clearly themes are important, but for me, it's first and foremost, emotional resonance um, and connectivity. I think there's a lot to be said to relatability, not necessarily likability, but relatability to characters that you're watching or that you're reading about. Um, being able to understand their plight. I was talking to somebody the other day about Breaking Bad um, and why it took off the way that it did. And the reason that it took off is, is because most everybody could relate to Walter White feeling that he settled for a mediocre life and wanting more. Welcome to Story Hinge. At Story Hinge, we explore foundational ideas and beliefs. We believe everyone has a beautiful story to grow. Now here's your host, Jason Vidari. All right, welcome to Story Hinge. Hope everyone is having a great day out there. Today we're going to be spending time with Lee Jessup. Lee is a career coach for professional and emerging screenwriters and has really spent her whole career in, in film and screenwriting and in that area and really found a place helping screenwriters themselves. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about also her view on stories and story itself and being in that world for her whole career. Um, she brought some really good perspective on story. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the interview. Yeah, Lee, I wanted to, I mean, I'm fascinated with some of your story that I found. And um, of course, I got connected to you through uh, Jen Grisanti, who I had on a few episodes ago. And it's a very dear friend who I'm actually having dinner with after this oh, tonight. That's, that's so. cool. <laughs> and we had a great conversation, uh, actually several, several months ago is when we probably talked. But maybe at first is to jump into a little bit of your story. I know that, you know, at age 17, you went off and maybe went the un unconventional route. Why don't we start a little, a little bit there and kind of weave that into where you're at today? All right. So my story is a kind of long and winding road. I was born to a film producer who decided to stop producing when I came around so he could spend time with me. So he actually went into editing rooms. I grew up in Israel, so he went to cut Israeli TV. So I actually grew up in cutting rooms. So the most kind of familiar and comforting sound to me is the sound of film rewinding and sound rewinding and the motion of like pulling film, marking film, splicing film. Oh, that's that's cool. how I grew up. Um, when I was 11 years old, he went back and did a movie um, that because I was very close with him, he allowed me to be very, very involved with it. Um, you know, really from start to finish, from concept all the way out to it was actually my tagline on the poster for the movie. But in Israel, you know, there, there's not that much money and not that much crew. Of course, there's the crew that you need, but you don't have a penny for more. Um, so having an eager, precocious 11 years old who actually wants to work um, was seen as a very positive thing. Um, and every day I would come to, to set after school and would be assigned a department and, you know, would go work and learn film. I came here at 13 with my father my, and my mother. At 16, my father informed me that he will not give me a job because that's nepotism. And apparently we don't do that in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I finished high school a year early and went on to uh, production manage, production coordinate my first film. Uh, became a production gypsy, just did movie after movie, back to back, low budget films, um, you know, 20 years old after breaking up with my boyfriend while sitting on the floor of the kitchen of the house that we were renting to shoot in and also double as an office because we didn't have money for both. <laughs> um, I realized that I'm probably not going to be making, you know, Lawrence of Arabia or Lord of the Rings anytime soon. Not that Lord of the Rings have been out yet. And so I really started digging into writing, um, which was always a passion, something I kind of humored, but I always wanted to follow my father's footsteps and become a producer um, and be kind of the, the, you know, the maestro behind storytelling via movies. But ultimately, I, I stepped into writing, which was always a big passion, a big love, um, wrote a script, a lot of very bad drafts to get to a draft that I thought was okay. Um, I knew a few producers, I sent it around, one of them really, really hated it and called to tell me as much in a very long conversation. 
Um, two loved it and one loved it enough to pick it up. So 23, I suddenly found myself in development on a feature um, and discovered that for me, it was just not an ideal situation. I was 23 and young and precious. Mm -hmm. So I kind of moved over to the development side of developing story uh, for one of those producers with writers. And I really, really loved that. But I felt ultimately a deeper loyalty to the writer than I did to the mission of the production company, which is probably not a good idea when the production company is picking up the tab. Mm. Um, and so from there, I, you know, kind of went through a few different paths that eventually led me to career coaching. And now as a career coach, I work with writers full time to develop their career with the understanding that there is no screenwriting career, or television writing career without good content, without good story. Mm. So here we are. Well, there you go. In a nutshell, huh? Well, I want to go back to hearing a little bit, you know, you know, you started off in this area, like you said, from a young age. What were your thoughts in, in terms of story? Was it an immediate appeal? Um, what, what did you do with those, like that first, I guess, desire to be in this world? Listen, I, I, I don't know another world. And I grew up in a household. My mother's an artist. My father's film producer. So nobody ever encouraged me to go be a doctor, right? I mean, I wrote... I think it's kind of a very um, forgiving term for what I actually did. But I thought I wrote my first movie when I was in third grade. Mm. Um, I wrote a short and I shot it with friends. I wrote, I dictated short stories to my mother from a young age. I remember a walk that I had with my father when I was about 10 years old. Um, he took me in Jerusalem to see Flashdance. And I was a dancer, so clearly it was a very powerful movie for me. But it was a talk, a long walk home along the walls of the old city in Jerusalem, where he asked me about what I thought the theme of the movie was. Mm. Um, now, I was a kid that always, my favorite activity on a Saturday was to sit in, ba in bed with a pile of books and just read everything backwards and forwards. When he got back into features, it was reading scripts. But it was on that walk that I started to understand what you can say and the messaging that you can instill into any storytelling, but specifically cinematic and televised episodic um, storytelling that really just blew me away. I wanted I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to participate in that because I feel like all of us have our morals and our ethics and the things that we believe in and the things that we are conflicted by. Um, and cinematic storytelling, visual storytelling really allows you to explore it in such a meaningful way. And I just I just wanted to play. Hmm. There's a certain message you wanted to get out there through that, that medium. Or I mean, just... I'm sure I'm sure I've had many. I mean, mm -hmm. especially in my teenage years, you think every every thought is important um, <laughs> and worth sharing. Um, yeah. Luckily for all of us, especially my husband, I've grown up a little bit since then. Um, but I felt like you know I've always been one for social justice. I've always been one for optimism and faith and determination and fighting a good fight. And interestingly, it's a lot of the material that now I see my own writers that I work with very pulled towards. And I think that that's kind of what bonds us creatively in the development process. We can see eye to eye and what inspires us thematically. And, and I use the term fairly broadly myself. We say story and it's, it's, it's even more broadly used all over the place anymore. So when I say what is a story? What, what 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 comes to your mind? Gosh, everything from a, a piece of typed paper to a line of music. Hmm. Um, story can can take any form, right? It can be a a creek traveling through, and everything that it brings with everything it takes away, everything it brings um, to the very literal typed page. I love typewriters. I have a bit of an obsession with them. I've owned a few old Remingtons in my time. Um, you know, for me, it, it can take on any form. It can be a poem, a, a song, a, like I said, a line of, of, of music. And how do you know it's a good story for you when you, for me, a good story is something that resonates emotionally. Um, so that something that I may not be able to intellectually necessarily check all the boxes, um, but that pulls me and grips me emotionally. Um, the show takes me into worlds or characters or points of view that I've not seen before, 
can be a very familiar character, um, but a different take on them or a different point of view on them or a different journey for them. Um, clearly themes are important, but for me, it's first and foremost, emotional resonance, um, and connectivity. I think there's a lot to be said to relatability, not necessarily likability, but relatability to characters that you're watching or that you're reading about, um, being able to understand their plight. I was talking to somebody the other day about Breaking Bad, um, and why it took off the way that it did. And the reason that it took off is, is because most everybody could relate to Walter White feeling that he settled for a mediocre life and wanting more. Hmm. That's what drives the better part of that show on an emotional level. Um, and so for me, relatability is really important, showing me things that I haven't necessarily seen before. Now, that doesn't mean reinventing the world. I much, in many ways, I much prefer saying things that I just have never seen in that way or being taken into worlds that were right there, but just not exploited. Um, that really excites me. I saw a movie last night called Pimp um, that took me into the Bronx, um, the world of pimps and a female pimps. Just, I haven't seen that before. I haven't met that character before. Um, and so it was just really exciting. It's, it's a journey that I want to go on. Hmm, yeah, I can totally relate. I, I'm, I'm so fascinated with the time that we live in. And I think of, to some degree, I'm fascinated with ancient things. And storytelling is one of those, you know, back at campfires. Yeah, go back to the Greeks. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's been around for a long time. And the beauty about it is that the structure of story, you know, whether you look at a novel, whether you look at a, at a screenplay, or whether you look at a pilot, or whether you look at, at an overarching TV series, or whether you look at a short story, structurally, overall, the similarities are resounding. And if you track track it back, it'll take you back to Greek drama. Hmm. Right back there. And, and this is a tried and true structure that fits with our EQ, right? Both of our IQ and our EQ, we can plug into that. So I don't think it's for nothing that we structure story today the way that we do. It's been tested for thousands of years mm -hmm. do you see changes in that or evolving of the story and storytelling obviously the, sure. obviously the formats have changed over time but and maybe the types of stories what do you what, what do you see in your world formats change and evolve for sure i think also the way that we go into a story changes um specifically in cinema i'm seeing kind of less linear mm -hmm. storytelling um you know, less of a straightforward beginning, middle event. And then you are going to have that three act structure in there inherently. Um, but at the end of the day, the way we're going into it is a little different. A few years ago, there was a screenplay that was very well regarded. Um, that was called bubbles that went all around Hollywood and came on top of the blacklist, which is our kind of top prestige list of best liked scripts in the industry for any given year. And it was a screenplay that was told from the point of view of Michael Jackson's chimp. It was called Bubbles. Hmm. I think Michael Jackson meets Hamlet, <laughs> told from the point of view of Bubbles the chimp. Um, and it was just a different way into a story. Everybody thought it will never get made. Now it's getting made in stop motion animation by the same people who made Anna Melisa. Um, but we are looking for different ways to tell stories because at the end of the day, I mean, not to belittle story, but in many ways we, we have been telling the same old stories uh, for thousands of years. We're looking for new and different and exciting ways to tell them, show us something we haven't seen before. And I think that that's really exciting. Do you see stories, I guess, the maybe a broader role that they're supposed to play in? in again, it kind of goes back to that. It has been a way that we have passed on information and knowledge and, and culture for so long. Do you see a place okay. where maybe a place where we're missing out on, on using story? I think story, this is where you're going to, to get kind of a little bit more of the raw me. I think we, we live in challenging political times, to mm -hmm. say the least. Um, I think it's the role of storytellers to reflect what they see in society, to shine a light on society, to sometimes guide the path to where we should be going, where we shouldn't be going. 
I think it's the, it's the role of the artist, be they a storyteller, a musician, a painter, a sculptor, um, to reflect on what is happening in society. So I think that not only do they do these stories carry forth um, who we are and who we've been and the fabric that makes us who we are today, but I think they also serve an important and active role in society. Um, and I think for me, one of the most exciting things is a writer with something to say, as opposed to just, I want to write a book, I want to make movies, I want to make television. All that is great, but having something to say, having something to use that very large, expensive vehicle for, to me, is all the more powerful. Where does that come from? For within, you know, you work with a lot of writers, and where do you, where are they able to draw from? Is it just from life experiences that they're able to draw that from, or, or are you observers Everywhere. of life, life? experience? Um, I mean, most writers that I work with are constantly reading books. They're constantly researching. They're constantly marking blog posts and news items and recording sixty minutes and anything that they can to try and find a shred of story that excites them and triggers them. So if they're drawing, some of them will draw from real life experience. Something will suddenly happen where they'll go, Oh my God, that's, that's a movie. And I actually have some commentary that I want to, I want to share the experience. And I also want to say what I have to say about this experience. Um, and I think that's how you see movies like Rachel getting married, um, suddenly getting made. Um, but we also see a lot of historical movies, right? First Man, which is a really interesting movie by Dane and Chazelle that clearly cl- draws on history, draws on stories that maybe we haven't told before, haven't told in the same way before, and contributes um, to that kind of fabric of storytelling. I find stories come from anywhere. Most writers are often told, um, write what you know. I actually find that it's not... Write, write what you know is not quite so literal as people think about it. People think about, okay, well, what do I know? What does my street look more thematically? What, what can that be evolved into in a more cinematic or televised sense that makes it that much more interesting? Um, what are the themes that you're excited about? What is the emotional experience that you went through that you can maybe blow up and tell in the most accessible commercial or grand fashion? that still remains a true emotional experience that you have a point of entry into because of your own emotional experience. Hmm, that's good. Now I've heard you describe screenwriting specifically, but as, as, a, as a craft, mm-hmm. that probably applies to storytelling. Can you explain what you mean by that and how you get better at it? Um, unlike poetry, um, which is really in the hands of the poem of the poet, and the moment the poet commits the poem to the page, the poem is done. Whether you like it or not is a whole other conversation. Screenwriting specifically, storytelling, um, is something that Rachmaninoff perfectly would agree. And so I do think it takes... So yeah, he has some talent. He's not a born writer. There are those few that, that are just... Um, and she ultimately had to take a step back and say, yeah, I don't know if I want that. No, that's good. Another thing I heard you say is that to deal with um, rejection and failure. I thought you had a great, great message along those lines. And not again, you're talking about screenwriters, but I think it really applies to life in general. How should we take failure and rejection? Churchill said something to the tune of success is defined by how one goes from failure to failure. Hmm. Um, there's another great quote when you're going through hell, keep going. I think failure is critical. I think that without failure, you don't learn. And it's not about how you fail. It's about how you get up from it. Um, So I I think it's important to learn from failure. The reality is that if you try hard at something, you will fail. It's Mm -hmm. inevitable. Um, You know, to really simplify this, my daughter is a gymnast, right? And um, she trains really hard. She trains 16 hours a week. And when she first started, um, so I think the important thing is not whether or not you fail or holding that is the one thing that cannot happen because it's guaranteed to happen, but rather examining how you approach failure and what you learn from failure, how you do things better, how you write better, how you challenge yourself differently following the failure. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, you know, I want to jump back into your a little bit of your story again and you know how you said you kind of that change of direction in your own life. And realizing, hey, this is not 
this is not where I want to go. How did that, how that manifest for you? How'd you figure that out? Um, you know, when you watch tennis games and you watch the tennis player on the court, whether it's Roger Federer or Serena Williams or any, any one of those amazing guys, Rafael Nadal, um, most people cheer for the tennis player. I tend to get really excited for the coaches, um, which was <laughs> something that I realized about myself in my late 20s. Um, I've always been one of those that would rather focus on others than I would on myself. Um, and so I always, at a young, young age, when, when, I, when I made my own deal, I had other friends who were right on the verge. And I found that I was much better negotiating for them than I was for myself. Mm. Um, I was much better off fighting for them than I did myself. And I took a lot of pleasure in it. Whenever I was able to help them, I found a lot of satisfaction in that. With me, I always felt a sense of dissatisfaction. Didn't do it right, didn't do enough, didn't give enough, didn't take enough. There was always that kind of sense of self-doubt. But I found that I'm most in my element when I'm trying to figure out how to help others. It sounds, I'm not that altruistic as a human being. So <laughs> I'm by no means trying to shade myself that. I just really enjoy it. I really like figuring out what makes other people tick, what their strengths are, how to capitalize on their strengths, how to challenge them. I've always been that person. I've always been the person that, you know, weird people go to for advice. Um, when my son was born, my husband kind of joked that our couch became the couch that everybody would just like show up and sit on and talk to me for two hours and then leave dealing with whatever problems we talked about for two hours. Cause I certainly had no energy to talk to anyone about anything of my own. Um, <laughs> I just always loved listening to people, you know, early on in life, I thought maybe I would go be a therapist where maybe I'd go be a psychologist, but ultimately felt that I would, or worried. There were two fears. One was I thought that I would go and work, study abnormal psychology, criminal psychology. Um, but I have an kind of a d overdeveloped sense of empathy. And I don't know that you want to work in abnormal psychology with an overdeveloped sense of empathy for your subjects. I just, it seems to me like a misguided, uh, approach. The other side was, okay, what if you go and work as a, as a psychologist and you give advice to an abused wife who stays in her abusive relationship for the five years that she works with you? She never leaves. And I thought, oh my God, I'd shoot myself. Mm. I would be so frustrated and so angry and so moved emotionally because I'm, I'm the type of person who gets very easily invested in people that she cares about. And again, overdeveloped sense of empathy. I easily come to care about the people in my immediate space. And so coaching became a very natural scenario because there is some element of connectivity. Psychology is, I, th I think, overstating it a little bit. Um, but really kind of figuring out people's strengths, weaknesses, advising, supporting, cheering on sometimes you know serving as a tough reality check mm -hmm. um and the focus of screenwriting really gives me a great way to kind of utilize my natural strengths and my undying interest in the entertainment industry hmm. that's very cool it seems like you found a really good mix there that matches up with your yourself to be honest i i didn't just for the record i didn't find it like other people came to me and said like you have to do this and i, I said what is this? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, well, that's fascinating. So you, you didn't see that in yourself first until the no, people I showed didn't, it. Not at all. I had two, I, I was already working with writers kind of unofficially. Um, and I had a client visiting Los Angeles and I got her together at dinner with another client who was local here. And suddenly out of nowhere, they started with a, like, you have to do this full time. And I kept saying, I don't understand what this is. I literally don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so I sat on it for about a year and then I said, okay, you know, when I'm dying, when I'm on my deathbed, I don't want to regret never trying this. It's going to fail. So I'm going to go for it just so that I have no regrets. Um, then I'll, you know, go do something else. And within three months, it became a full-time job. So. Oh, that's cool. No, you really confirmed that. I actually reached out to some of my previous bosses and asked them, you know, tell me what you thought of me when we worked. 
because it's, I think a lot of time we have a hard time seeing ourselves and maybe seeing a strength or, or weakness perhaps and, and, and figuring out where we want to be. So I think there's, there's a lot of, a lot of value in, in doing that. And Absolutely. It's good that you listen to some of your friends there. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I usually believe that there are much smarter people in any given room. So I'm happy to listen to them. Do you have a story of someone, I guess you, that you've worked with, some writer that you worked with and you really felt like that really, I don't know, that, that basically illustrates some of this, uh, the best part of how maybe you're really proud of where it went to or how you were able to work with that person? I'm lucky in that I have a number of those, but I, recently I got an email from a client of mine, a longtime client of mine, who's also a dear, dear friend. Um, and she told me about it. She was sitting with her husband and his in-laws, and he's in the entertainment industry as well, her in-laws, so her husband, his parents. Um, and they were having a conversation about what's the moment that you kind of made it? What, what's the thing that kind of sends you down the path and brought you to where you are today? And she's a TV writer. And she um, she said to them that for, for her, it was coming to work with me, which happened five years ago now. Um, she came to me as a feature writer, um, a very talented feature writer with a completed feature. And we were trying to come up with new ideas to write a new script to capitalize on her experience, her knowledge. Um, but I found that she really hated third acts with a passion. She could not tie up those stories. Didn't want to, um, huh. tie up those stories. And TV was just starting to, I mean, it was already becoming popular. Don't get me wrong. It's not that there was, no life in television, but it certainly wasn't the beast that it is today. And back then, after, you know, trying a few different ideas that we would get to the end of a second act and kind of go, we don't know where this is going. And I don't feel passionate to take it one way or another, said the writer. Um, at some point, I said, okay, you know, let's, let's try TV, because you don't want to write third acts, you don't want to complete your story. So whether or not I agree with her, she credits mm-hmm. my kind of pushing and my insisting and my educating and my supporting as the thing that pushed her to TV, which she never would have done otherwise. And she's very successful now. So there's an example. No, that's very good. No, I mean, as you're sharing that, other memories of my, you know, helping people, serving them, um, coaching and teaching. I'm an engineer by trade and I've helped some coworkers, um, just some mathematics and stuff like that. And there's a, it's funny that those memories are still there and, not that I did much, but it was that helping someone else and helping them take the next step along their journey. Yeah, sometimes you can. I mean, oftentimes, and it's it's actually kind of I, I'm a big believer in this. You you can oftentimes help better and see more from the outside than the person who's within the journey. Um, so you want to try and help and highlight what you think would be helpful. Hopefully, most of the time you'll be right. Some of the time you'll be wrong. Um, I've been very lucky in that my writers have taken my advice and credited me for other advice that I promise you I didn't give them, but somehow they still think it came from me, Mm. but they've let me on the journey. And, you know, one of the fun parts, the funnest part of the job is that I get to work with writers who are constantly breaking in. So I have, you know, this week I have a writer who started with me when he was nowhere, who's now show running his first show. Um, Mm. He was, he was writing on a couple of TV shows previously and now he's a big showrunner, and it's just a very, it's very gratifying to see that happen to talented, good, hardworking people. It's I can't even begin to tell you how fulfilling that is. What would you say to someone who's, I guess, at the beginning stages, playing with the idea? Maybe, hey, maybe I want to go down this. Maybe I want to check this out. I'm not sure. What would you say to someone in that that state? First of all, watch a lot of film, watch a lot of TV, see what you love, see what you love today. Start reading scripts, start playing with ideas, seeing if they have legs. Learn a lot, study a lot. Um, so read, you know, if you can't, if you don't have a screenwriting school next to you, go, go read a screenwriting book, go pick up one, pick up five of them, um, go start thinking about structure, start reading scripts and see if that connects to you and read scripts that are current to the market. Don't read Tootsie, no offense to Tootsie, great, great script, but it's been a while. Mm. Um, you know, but, but really see whether or not the doing of it is attractive to you rather than the saying that you're doing it or the thought of participating. Um, because it's a lot of hard work, but writers do break in. But again, a lot of hard work. I can't emphasize this enough. If, you know, once in a while I'll talk to a writer who will say, well, I wrote a screenplay because I have some debt 
there are better, faster ways to make money than screenwriting. Like we always say, it's, you know, I say it's three to five years to break in from the time you have a strong piece of content on your hands. Agents and managers in this industry will tell you that it's five to 10 years. Um, so if you amortize whatever it is that you make over those years, it's not pretty. Yeah. Um, don't do it for money, even though hopefully you will be well paid. Um, and I'm not, this is not me saying that writers shouldn't seek to get paid, but it'll take a while. Um, so there has to be a love and an appreciation at least, uh, for the hard work and a willingness to participate in it at first in order to carry you through. Because again, if it's a money making proposition, there are better money making propositions. And if you look statistically at the number of writers who break in and the number of, of writers who get really, really wealthy, it's, you know, that those numbers are not fantastic. Yeah, sure, there are the ones who do, but it's not, you don't have, you know, 50,000 writers getting a ton of money every year. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It makes sense here. You're, like you said, there's a lot of competition there and um, it's got to be something really enjoy to do. Yeah, you have to have the passion for the doing, not just the passion for the being. It's two different things. Yeah. And that's a, I'm very much exploring the entrepreneurial world, and it's, it's very similar to that, right? No matter what it might be, if you really want to do something at, at a high level and do it well, it's got to be something. You, you have to like the process. It can't be yeah. something at the end, end of the game. I, I, I like that the vision of this goal or this dream at the end, but I hate hate the work getting there. It's not going to – it's too much to get there. Yeah. There are writers that I know who hate writing but are so compelled to do it, which is fine by me. Hmm. You can hate it, but if you're compelled to do it every day, fine. Hate it all day long. But if you are pulled to the computer, if you're pulled to the typewriter every day because you want to express yourself this way or because telling these stories is just something that you can't not do, fine. You, you don't have to love it, but you have to have some passion for it. You have to have some fire burning, even if it's hatred. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like a very fun fire to keep burning on. <laughs> but I get it. How about the future? Where, where do you see this storytelling in the, in the world that you're at? Where Do you see it changing? Where Where does it go? Is it going somewhere different? Listen, it's, somewhere? Always an, it's always an evolving thing. I think it's this is a really interesting time for diverse storytelling, for new points of view. I think the market is really responding to more diverse, more female casts, um, stories that are being told about no offense to, you know, the straight white male, but about characters and stories that are coming from other points of view, which I think is, is overdue. And I think we're just at the beginning of that. I think mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more female directors, uh, breaking onto the scene. I think we're seeing more screenplays that are, falling outside of the norm um which is really exciting i feel like there there's just a well of stories that we're just beginning to dig into because we're just beginning to really accept diversity as a standard and not a novelty um and you're seeing that with you know tv shows like vita um with shows like with movies like pimp um and you're going to see more and more of this and this is just too like off the top of my head but there's there's a ton of it hmm. um and it's really exciting yeah it does do you, do you see one thing i've always i guess i've wondered about just with the advancements of technology and and that we're able to do so much more from home like this conversation right now which we couldn't have done mm -hmm. you know years ago do you see yep. some of that that story creation moving out to other places around that you can oh, do absolutely. more personally okay absolutely. i mean listen there's there, there are all these great scripted podcasts now. Um, we saw Homecoming just move from the pod, from a podcast to a TV show, which personally, I, you know, love Julia Roberts, but for me, Homecoming will always be, you know, Catherine Keener or David Schwimmer, like those, mm. those actors. Uh, but we're seeing more and more of that. Um, there was Bronze Town that Lawrence Fishburne and Lorenz Tate did. Um, that's a scripted podcast. So we're seeing new formats to tell the story these stories which is really exciting um and also thinking about them differently because we're thinking about audio stories rather than visual stories mm -hmm. um you know visual stories all about show don't tell audio stories is a different approach right you can't show um mm -hmm. so what can you hear what can you convey how do you convey how do you do so organically um so you know i think that's just the start of this evolution into audio storytelling that's really exciting. I mean, I think we're about three, four, five years in. 
Um, but it's, it's really something that's just catching on. Um, and the sky's the limit. Yeah. It's fascinating to me because I'm, I have attended podcast conferences and seen some of the other work that people are doing. And mm-hmm. I mean, the audio is, is, is fascinating to me. And I guess I just enjoyed that format, it, but, but it also reminds me of going back to old radio, right? The old radio stories yeah. and, and have yeah. some, some of those elements coming back. Right, because you don't really get it with books on tape, right? They're not performed for you type of podcast. Mm. If you don't find it, if you're looking for it, some yeah. people don't want it, which is fine. Um, but I really feel that there is so much, and it's so exciting. Yeah, well, I'm excited to see where things go on this, and and uh, for me, it's a newer fascination in my life. Like I said, I was like, been an engineer my whole life, and these last several years, I'm exploring in different areas. And I guess I want to make sure people can connect with you, uh, Lee, and know where to find you, and if they want to work with you, and how do they go about that? Um, so the best way to reach me is on my website, which is really simple, leejessup.com. All right. I want to thank you all for being with us here on StoryHinge. Lee, thank you again for being here as well. We had a bit of a glitch there on the on the end of the this audio. It lost and scrambled the last couple minutes of our conversation. So, again, if you want to connect with Lee Jessup, you can do so at leejessup.com is the best place. It's L E E. J-E-S-S-U-P, and those links will be in the show notes and on the website. Just a few closing thoughts today. It'll be kind of a close, uh, a short one, a short wrap-up today. We're um, approaching the holiday season and a lot of activity here at the Vidari household. So I'm going to wrap this up and just close with it. I really enjoyed this conversation with Lee. Uh, a lot of great insight into story. Um, I love talking to people who have spent their life in creating story, analyzing story, helping people create story. Um, there's just a lot of depth to be learned from, from someone like Lee. And I, mostly I was touched by the power of story again. I mean, I, I've been in this for some time. I should not be surprised by it, but the, the power that it has to, I guess, both individually help us move from place to place, but also as a society and the power that story can, can play in that role. And, you know, I hope each one of you out there are looking at your own story and, Maybe crafting a little bit better, maybe being a little more intentional about how your story you want your story to play out. You guys, I hope you have a great um for those in the, the US here we're about to this is actually coming out right on Thanksgiving. So have a happy Thanksgiving today and I was I think I was gonna probably leave it right there for this time and you know invite you to subscribe, share the podcast with others. And also for those of you that want to go in depth into people in history, we have seventy three mentors is another podcast my brother and I are doing. We are beginning to study Karl Marx, so it's going to be an interesting one for us. So we spent time with Plato and with Galileo, and now we're in Karl Marx. So you guys have a great week, great couple weeks. We'll be back um, with our next guest. All right. Ciao.